Vermont Public feeds your mind with informative programming and education and nourishes your spirit with music and entertainment. When you make a contribution to Vermont Public through midnight on Giving Tuesday, it will also assist Vermonters facing food insecurity. With each gift, the Vermont Community Foundation will donate 18 healthy meals to the Vermont Food Bank. It's a meaningful way to help our neighbors and support Vermont Public. Please give at vermontpublic.org slash givingtuesday or call 800-639-6391 and thanks. From Vermont Public, this is Brave Little State. I'm Josh Crane. And I'm Michaela LaFrac. Hi, Prashad and Michaela. Good to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I'm in a ranch house on a cul-de-sac in Winooski. It belongs to Prashant Singh and his wife. They bought it recently, and when I show up for an interview, Prashant takes me on a tour. In the kitchen, he points through the window into the big backyard. Behind these trees is, yeah. is the school soccer field. Oh, so you can just, yeah, the like, kids can just run yeah, over yeah, there they if they just, want to. They just, so even if when they have their soccer match, I just sit in my property and watch their match. <laughs> <laughs> Prashant has three kids in Winooski Public Schools. He's proud of that soccer field, and really every part of the school system. He cares about improving it, too. He was part of a group of parents who noticed the district didn't have a school bus system, so they set one up and ran it themselves. The schools are also one reason why Prashad really cares about voting. It is about my money, right, that is going to the state and city. So I should also have a choice to say that my, my hard-earned money should be used for the betterment of the city, for, the, for good roads, for good uh, school. But for most of the nine years Prashant has lived in Winooski, he wasn't allowed to vote. That's because Prashant is not a U.S. citizen. Prashant moved to the U.S. from India on a work visa. He works for a healthcare technology company, and his wife's a dental assistant. They applied for U.S. citizenship back in 2016. But because of the type of work visa he has and where they're from, it'll probably take years more for them to get approved. Still, even though Prashant isn't a citizen, he really wants to vote locally. So a few years ago, when some Winooski residents started discussing ways to allow non-citizens like him to vote, Prashant jumped right into the effort. He even joined a committee of Winooski residents exploring a change to the city's charter. He learned a lot that surprised him about voting in America. I even was not aware that like a uh, like few decades back, women were not allowed to vote. They, later they got uh, voting rights and also it is just a process, like a, a, a ongoing process of development. Now, the committee wasn't all rah-rah on the idea of letting non-citizens vote. They had some spicy debates. Some folks thought it would be a good way to be welcoming to newcomers. And they pointed to the fact that legal residents, regardless of their citizenship status, pay local taxes. But other people said voting should remain a right of U.S. citizens alone. So I call them to my house also sometimes so that we can have a, a broader discussion on this. And now we all are good friends. The people who, who oppose who the idea, yeah. you would invite them over yeah, yes, to talk? Yes. And it worked. Winooski's residents approved a change to their city's charter. And in 2021, the Vermont legislature made it official. Now, people who live in Winooski, who have work visas, refugee or asylum status, permanent residency, essentially all the city's legal residents can vote on local and school issues. Montpelier also got non-citizen voting the same year as Winooski. Burlington got it just this year. And to be clear, this isn't a common thing in other places. There are just 17 jurisdictions in the entire country where non-U.S. citizens can vote in local elections. And Vermont is home to three of them. Though I did call around to a bunch of other Vermont towns, and I didn't hear of anywhere else that's considering it. 
why isn't everybody just psyched that this is happening? Maybe they are. Oh, maybe they just this is our brave little state question asker, Charlotte Blend. She lives in Winooski, too, and she's really into the idea of non-citizen voting. She wonders, now that these charter changes have been on the books for a bit... What effect has non-citizen voting had in the towns where it is now legal, Winooski, Montpelier, and Burlington? Brave Little State is Vermont Public's listener-powered journalism show. Each episode starts with a question about Vermont that's been asked and voted on by you, our audience. Today, how changes in local election policy have affected three Vermont cities, from their councils and school boards... We've actually had a few non-citizen folks apply to be on school board. ...to their residents. That shows the attitude of our leaders and the attitude of the people who are working in the city. Reporter Michaela Lefrac talks to voters and a lot of city clerks about the, at times, controversial policies. Our position is we want to see people go all the way and become citizens. And she checks in with a city in Maryland that legalized non-citizen voting three decades ago. Typically, we have a few hundred registered and maybe 20 percent vote. We're a proud member of the NPR Network. Welcome. Thanks for listening to Brave Little State, where we have support from Sunset Lake CBD, a farmer-owned company crafting CBD products with Vermont-grown hemp. Their product listing and information on home delivery available at sunsetlakecbd.com. And Lake Champlain Chocolates, where making chocolate is a family tradition and giving it can be yours. Celebrate the holiday season with handcrafted chocolates made in Vermont. Turkeys, Santas, snowmen, and gift box truffles, ready for giving. Shop in Burlington, Waterbury, and their new location in Stowe Village, or online at lakechamplainchocolates.com. Before we dive in, a quick note on terminology. When it comes to describing these changes to the voter rolls, some places use the phrase non-citizen voting. Others use all-legal resident voting. In Vermont, they're both used to describe people who have a legal status, but who are not U.S. citizens, refugees, asylum seekers, green card holders. You'll hear both phrases, non-citizens and all legal residents, in this story. Also, when we talk about voting, we're talking about local elections. Think city council members, not state legislators or governor. All right, so back to our winning question asker, Charlotte. We meet up at her office in Burlington. She works for the University of Vermont Health Network. And the first thing she explains to me is her accent. She's from the United Kingdom, and she's still a citizen there, not the U.S. I have a green card, so I'm a legal resident. Like Prashant, Charlotte calls Winooski her forever home. She has a house and a spouse, and her kids go to school there. For the most part, being a green card holder doesn't affect her day-to-day life. You can very much live your life without without that having a big effect. And I can't be the president. But apart from that, you know, it, it doesn't affect my everyday life. Except for one thing. Charlotte really cares about voting, especially on school issues. She was thrilled when Winooski's charter change got approved. But she wonders, is that how other non-U.S. citizens feel? Are they as psyched as she is? Or does the idea of voting feel more fraught? Navigating the U.S. immigration system is already no cakewalk, even for someone like Charlotte, who grew up speaking English and who's been here for more than 20 years. It's still nerve-wracking to me when I travel. What if they say my U.S.-born children can get on the flight, but they stop me getting on the flight? You know, it, it... It's stressful, and I don't have any other complicating factors. You know, I have all my paperwork. I have my birth certificate. I have everything in order. I have copies of everything I've filed with immigration since 2000. Many people don't have that. Charlotte sensed there might be some barriers keeping other legal residents from rushing to the ballot box like she did. The numbers bear that out. For the first town meeting day in Winooski with all legal resident voting, 49 non-U.S. citizens registered. 
The next year, that number went up to 61. But that's still just 10 percent of the city's total non-U.S. citizens. To figure out what some of the barriers might be, I head to Vermont's capital, Montpelier. It was the first Vermont jurisdiction to look into the idea of non-citizen voting. So arguably, it'd be the farthest along. It's a little chaotic in here. That's quite all right. Hello. Good morning. I go to City Hall to meet with the guy who knows everything about voting in Montpelier. In a sense, it's a no-brainer. City clerk John Odom. I mean, these are folks who are paying taxes, they own property, they have kids in school. Why wouldn't they have an equal say in the budget of the city, um, who their representatives are? John's really proud of his work on this issue. But for years, he says, he didn't think it was possible. Every so often, a resident would come to him and ask if there was a way for non-citizens to vote. And he'd say a pretty quick no. But then, about five or six years ago... I was taking courses uh, through the University of Minnesota to get an election administrator certificate. And we got to a module on non-citizen voting. And I'm looking at all these towns around the country that do it, and I'm like, I guess I didn't know what I was talking about. There's, There's a way we could do it. In order to do it, Montpelier would need to change its municipal charter. And there was a motivated group of people who wanted to make that happen. Many were non-U.S. citizens or married to one. A German woman who's lived in Montpelier for 46 years told me she has paid plenty of taxes and was very ready to have a say on the city council and the local budget. A few years ago, the group got it done. It took a lot of signatures, community meetings, legislative hearings, oh, and overriding a veto from Governor Phil Scott, who doesn't think voting policies should vary town to town. But other than that, it was uh, very mellow. Then came the lawsuits. Right after Montpelier changed its charter, the Republican National Committee, the Vermont GOP, and a couple of individual Vermonters sued both Montpelier and Winooski. They alleged the cities were violating the state constitution. It was all paid for by a group backed by prominent Republicans like Karl Rove and GOP megadonor Steve Wynn. John Odom was named as a defendant in the suit. Were you surprised to see yourself named? Oh, yes. I thought that was crazy. <laughs> Fortunately, the, the legal system did too. The suits were both thrown out. The Vermont Supreme Court ruled that towns are allowed to make their own changes to municipal election rules. So Montpelier got down to the task of registering these voters. But when town meeting day rolled around in March 2022, just eight non-U.S. citizens had registered. Five of them voted. I asked John how many there are now, and he pulls out a skinny blue three-ring binder. These are my non-citizen voters, and I was just looking at them, so they're mildly unorganized here. There's a whole binder. One, two, I keep them in a separate binder, yeah, just because it's handy. Hmm. What have I got? I've got three... Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, look at that. Eleven, twelve. We're on a roll. Yeah, not a whole lot happening on that front in Montpelier, but we're still very proud of it. Of course. Out of 6,330 registered voters in Montpelier, 12 are non-U.S. citizens, just under 0.2%. By way of comparison, that's an even lower percentage than in Winooski. There could be a couple of reasons for that. Montpelier's population isn't as diverse as Winooski's. Also, Montpelier hasn't done as much direct outreach about the new voting rules as Winooski has. And in Montpelier, non-U.S. citizens cannot vote on school issues, like the school budget. That's because Montpelier's part of a school district that includes other towns. All in all, it's been pretty quiet in Montpelier since the lawsuit got dismissed. John's even on good terms with one of the Montpelier residents who signed his name to the lawsuit. You know, people are individuals. They're going to come at this from any number of different ways. And I respect that. And, you know, he comes in to pay bills and things. And it's not an issue. We 
on a first name basis and everything. But he sued you. <laughs> what are you going to do, right? <laughs> Sounds pretty hunky dory, right? But the opposition hasn't gone away completely. Other people are still pushing back against the new rules. Our position is we want to see people go all the way and become citizens. Paul Dame, chair of the Vermont GOP. After the lawsuits were dismissed, the Vermont GOP and the National Republican Party filed another one, this time just against Winooski. Non-U.S. citizens in Winooski can vote on school issues, and the Republican groups argue that's unconstitutional because the school budget's part of a statewide funding system, not just a local one. As of when we're publishing the story, that lawsuit is still active. But when Paul and I talk, he doesn't bring up schools. He brings up his wife. It's been interesting for me because I'm, uh, I'm married to uh, a former green card holder who became a citizen. I ask if he's talked about this issue with her. I feel like that'd be an interesting marital discussion. It's nothing that, that she ever felt um, you know, was, was unfair. And when she got to the point of saying, you know, I do want to participate in this in this level, I do want to participate in the political process. Then from the time we made the decision until getting her her citizenship, it was a matter of months. I think there's there's probably some misinformation out there about what that process actually looks like. Maybe that'll be part part of your story as well. It will be part of my story. I talked to the head of Vermont's refugee office, who says the naturalization process for any new American takes an average of 18 to 24 months. Applying, doing the citizenship interview, taking the exam. It can move faster or slower, depending on where you're from. For people from, say, India, like Prashant, it can take way longer than average. That's because of federal immigration caps for certain countries. And for refugees or asylum seekers, it can take even longer. An immigration attorney in Rutland tells me it takes, on average, 7 to 10 years for refugees and asylum seekers to attain full citizenship. Paul Dame thinks there's got to be a way to speed up the citizenship process. And he says spending time on that would ultimately help more people than non-citizen voting. It seems like in a, in a couple months we could develop a class, help those people out, get them through the naturalization process, and we we would have uh, citizens who are even better engaged, better educated, and more fully able to participate in the process. While we talk, there's something else that keeps dinging around in my head. I've spent a good amount of time reporting on voting rights. At a previous job, I made an entire podcast about Washington, D.C.'s push for statehood and representation in Congress. In D.C., the statehood debate is unavoidably political because most D.C. residents are registered Democrats. D.C. statehood would almost certainly mean more Democrats in Congress. I ask Paul Dame if there's a similar dynamic going on here. Do you have any concerns that the push for non-citizen voting is a push by by local Democratic leaders to expand the Democratic electorate? Um, uh, I I think that's certainly a possibility. Uh, I I don't know if that's that's the case uh, because I feel like a lot of the people I've talked to who have who have been immigrants and who have started to become more interested in voting are are you know come from all different backgrounds. I ask. I think they're just as diverse as the rest of Vermonters. Yeah, I, I ask because it seems like at least on a national level there are so many debates about um, voting, voter access, voter registration that really fall along um, kind of stereotypical party lines. You know, Republicans tend to be more conservative, meaning we we have a system in place. It's in place for a reason. And we need to have, you know, extraordinary reasons to, to change that, because anytime you make it ch- make a change to a system, you don't necessarily understand what the unintended consequences are. Unintended consequences. 
Paul points out that every town and city with all legal resident voting ends up creating a list of non-U.S. citizens who have registered to vote with all their personal information. People with ill intentions could get a hold of that. Ill intentions, he says, like people wanting to threaten or harm people on the list. For example, anyone can make a public records request and get a copy of a city's voter rolls, like what John Odom keeps in his binder in Montpelier. Here's Winooski's city clerk, Jenny Willingham. So I just have it on a spreadsheet, date of birth, address, and when I get a public record request, I have to supply that. Right now, the city clerks in Winooski, Burlington, and Montpelier have to maintain their own electronic voter registration lists for non-citizens. That's because the state system, the one used for everybody else, doesn't really compute non-citizen voters. The Secretary of State's office is looking into it, but changes aren't going to come for another couple of years. And this did come up. Winooski Mayor Christine Lott. You know, we raised this concern with non-citizen potential voters. It wasn't such a concern that people wouldn't want to still be able to vote. Prashant Singh in Winooski says it doesn't make him nervous, but for other people he's talked to, for sure. He tells me about one conversation he had with a refugee family. They are still uh, afraid that uh, they will be sidelined. What do you mean sidelined? Like people, I've seen like uh, they don't want to come and vote just because they are not citizens. And other people who are citizens, they will not like it. People might be scared. This is Hemant Gassing of Burlington. We are talking about the people uh, who had been living in the suppressive society that, you know, voting is against their government and they come to this country. Or um, you are voting to a country where there are tribal issues and then one tribe did not like other, you know, and then they don't go for the voting because of the threat. Hemant is from Bhutan but he lived in refugee camps in Nepal for nearly 20 years of his life. In 2011, he and his family were able to come to Vermont. About five years ago, he became a U.S. citizen. What do you like about Burlington? Mountains. You know, my ancestors were mountain and tri- uh, mountainous tribe, and I'm very fortunate that I'm in Vermont. You know, mountains are my hope. Mm. They are my uh, lived experience. They are my friends. Hemant was involved with the successful push for all legal resident voting in Burlington. But he says people need to understand how many barriers still exist, especially for refugees and asylum seekers. I'm talking from the perspective of somebody who had been suppressed for a long. There are a lot of barriers. As I said, language, you know, cultural barriers, um, you know, the trauma, traumatic experience from the past. For someone coming from a country where violence often occurs during elections, it might feel uncomfortable or even scary to show up to vote and see two separate tables, one for citizens and one for everybody else. That's how some polling places will look this coming March, when there's a presidential primary. The cities need to make sure non-U.S. citizens are only receiving local ballots. So Election Day has become a bit more complicated than it was. But the city clerks say they have people in states like Maryland who they can call for advice. First non-citizen voting was in 1993. More on that when we come back. Support for Brave Little State comes from Willing Hands in Norwich working with the community to help families experiencing food insecurity have a joyful holiday season with food on the table. To learn more about how you can help reduce food waste and end hunger in Vermont, visit willinghands.org. Interestingly enough, we're celebrating, recognizing 30 years of non-citizen voting in Tacoma Park. Jesse Carpenter is the city clerk of Tacoma Park, Maryland. Tacoma Park is kind of the OG when it comes to non-citizen voting. First non-citizen voting was in 1993. They also allow 16 and 17-year-olds to vote and immigrants without legal status. 
And since non-citizen voting was first instituted 30 years ago, Jesse and other city staff have worked through some similar concerns to the ones in Vermont, mainly that non-citizen voting might single certain people out or mess with their citizenship applications. When someone's filling out their naturalization paperwork, they do have to acknowledge if they voted in a local election. And that always raises a little flag, so they need to explain that. So they'll contact me and I prepare a letter for them. Jesse says that always does the trick. I've never had anyone come back and say they weren't able to uh, obtain citizenship because of it. Tacoma Park has also changed how they do voter registration to purposefully make it harder for the public to weed out who's a citizen and who's not. And 30 years in... Non-citizen voting is chugging along quietly and smoothly, though the participation rate is still pretty low. Typically, we have a few hundred registered and maybe 20 percent of them vote. Initially, there were a lot of non-citizens registered when it when it first became legal to vote here. But that really dropped off over time. All right. So to get back to our question, what is the effect of non-citizen voting in Vermont? Let's tally some results here. Winooski and Montpelier have each run two elections that included non-U.S. citizen voters. They showed up to the polls, but in relatively small numbers. Winooski's mayor, Christine Lott, says non-citizen turnout hasn't been big enough to have swayed the outcome on any issues. Remember, just over 1% of the registered voters in Winooski are non-U.S. citizens. But Mayor Lott does think the policy has changed Winooski in a different way. We've actually had a few non-citizen folks run for school board or apply to be on school board. So there's an increasing participation rate there in in local government. The Winooski charter change didn't just make it legal for non-citizens to vote. They can also apply for school board positions. Over in the state's largest city, Burlington, officials are gearing up for their first election with all legal resident voting in March. Real quick, let's throw in one more city clerk for good measure. Burlington's Sarah Montgomery. So we are just in the stages of starting to register voters. We have four voters registered so far. That's exciting. You got four in there. That's great. It is, yeah. (laughs) They're really exciting first ones to get in. All three Vermont cities are ramping up their outreach to new American communities, and they're translating their ballots into different languages. Hemant Gissing of Bhutan says it might take a couple years to convince non-citizens to show up, especially refugees and asylum seekers. Here in Burlington, uh, a lot of immigrants and refugees live in a two different world. One is uh, the one outside their home and one is inside their home. So step outside is a different culture. Once you're in your home, you're back either in Africa or Asia. You know, when you go out, then you are in Burlington, right? So it's not going to be as easy as posting on Front Porch Forum or translating a ballot. But Hemant says, honestly, it doesn't matter to him how many people actually show up. What matters is that the policy itself exists. I think that's very important. That shows the attitude of our leaders and the attitude of the people who are working in the city. It's a first step for the long journey. Our winning question asker, Charlotte Blend, plans to return to the polls on town meeting day. Her first time voting in 2022 is one of her favorite memories. And I was so proud because I could go down there to the senior center and um, get my sticker. And I made my husband take a picture of me outside the sign that's saying vote here. And for the first time I I could vote um, and was telling everyone, you know, when I went, this is my first time. And they're looking at me like, yeah, yeah, just move along, please. We're trying to get this process. And, but it, it did feel important. As for Prashant and his wife, their first time voting was more mundane. They both had to work on Election Day, so they submitted their ballots early. Prashant says for him, voting is a big part of what's keeping him in Winooski and in Vermont. 
If he didn't feel like he had a say in things, he might be more inclined to move to a place with a bigger Indian population or somewhere with less snow. This is what I like about Winooski, right? Because if I, I, I might be in South Burlington and I had no voice, I would have not bought properties. I, I, I would have said, OK, I'll, I'll live here for a while, then I'll move to to Boston or to some warmer place. But now uh, I have I have my voice here. So I, I feel myself rooted in Winooski. Yeah. yeah. Do you imagine you and your family staying in Winooski for yeah, oh, a yeah. long time? We, 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 will, we will be a, a Winooski citizen forever. Yeah. We have big plans for Winooski. Big plans, as in running for office? Prashant says if it could benefit Winooski residents, yeah, maybe he will. Thanks so much for listening to the show. And thanks to Charlotte Blend of Winooski for the great question. To see photos from Michaela's reporting, head to our website, bravelittlestate.org. While you're there, be sure to sign up for the BLS newsletter to stay up to date on new episodes and everything else happening in the BLS universe. We're also on Instagram and Reddit at BraveStateVT. This episode was reported by Michaela Lefrac and produced by Sabine Pooks. Editing and additional production from the rest of the Brave Little State team, Burgess Brown and me, Josh Crane. Digital support from Sophie Stevens. Angela Evansy is Brave Little State's executive producer. Our theme music is by Ty Gibbons. Other music by Blue Dot Sessions. Special thanks to Martin Ostermule, Elaine Wong, Liz Edsel, Tracy Dolan, and Anna Taddeo. Brave Little State is a production of Vermont Public and a proud member of the NPR Network. If you like our show, you can make a gift at bravelittlestate.org slash donate. Or leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. We'll be back soon with more people-powered Vermont journalism. Did you know you are physically adapting to all your swiping, scrolling, and tapping? We're changing our bodies and what they're able to do through our habits. NPR's Body Electric, a special interactive series investigating how to fix the relationship